this talk before. Um, it's about trauma and animal advocacy. Um, so for those who, who, who don't are familiar with my background, I'm a clinical psychologist. I work in a place in the United States that's really considered the leading place for treating and understanding and researching trauma and PTSD. Um, and over the past few years, I, I, when I, I've been giving animal advocacy talks, probably more than any other topic, I have folks come up to me afterwards and talk about issues related to their trauma. Um, in particular, they really connect with the idea that the trauma that they, they, may, they have experienced is somehow influential in the advocacy they do. And for some folks, the reason they become advocates in the first place is be, it's because of some, some past exposure to trauma in some way. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So I wanted to kind of do this topic justice and do a talk exclusively on trauma and animal advocacy. So kind of a good place to start when we're talking about trauma is how do we define trauma? And what, I'm going to start with the DSM-5 definition of trauma, not because I agree with it, I actually don't really agree with it, um, but this is a good starting point for us to think about what, what trauma actually is. So at least in the United States, to define psychiatric issues, to define psychiatric disorders, we use the DSM-5 as our kind of diagnostic manual. And this is how they define trauma when we're, when we're diagnosing PTSD. So trauma involved, the person was exposed to death, threatened death, actual or threatened serious injury, or actual or threatened sexual violence in the following ways. Direct exposure, witnessing the trauma, learning that a relative or close friend was exposed to a trauma, or indirect exposure to aversive details of the trauma, usually in the course of professional duties like first responders or medics or even psychologists. Um, so for those, for, for in the animal advocates in the room, you're probably recognizing that we are all exposed to trauma all the time just from having made that connection to non-human animals and the trauma that, and the violence and the death and the killing that they experience. I'm sure the folks, you know, the psychiatrists and psychologists in the room when they were kind of making up the, these, this definition of trauma weren't thinking of non-human animals. They were just thinking of humans because, you know, like all other institutions, psychology and psychiatry are also species as institutions. So they weren't really thinking of non-human animals. Um, however, if you really look at the definition, it really fits very well what we're all exposed to as, as animal advocates. Death all around us to, to non-human animals. One reason why I really don't like this definition is because I think it's really limiting. It's focusing on uh, exposure to death uh, and, and physical violence. And actually there's a lot of evidence that psychological abuse and psychological trauma can be every bit as impactful as physical violence and physical abuse. There's a lot of research on this in the domestic violence literature, and this is the, um, my research area, that psychological abuse can be every bit as harmful, it's, it's every bit as predictive of PTSD, depression, a range of negative outcomes as physical, physical violence. So we have to consider the effects of psychological trauma too, in my opinion, when we're, when we're thinking about our trauma exposure. So, like most things, you know, it, it, in, in academia, I think things get overly complicated and we get, we get a bunch of academics in a room and they're going to argue and you know, come up with really specific, strict definitions. Um, myself, this, this is the definition that I prefer. A trauma is an experience that produces psychological injury or pain. That really, that, that's really trauma in a nutshell. Something that, an event or a series of events that produces psychological injury or, or pain. It's, it's, it's really that simple in my opinion. So let's talk a little bit about what are some of the common sources of trauma that we as animal advocates may be exposed to. First, childhood violence and abuse. I have, I have really been struck at how just about every animal advocate friend I have has some past experience of trauma, often in childhood. Um, and for many folks, I believe that these early exposures to violence and abuse is ultimately what led us to really be feel passionately and even be rageful about uh, injustice, right? And for many of us, early on in our lives, we kind of made that connection and we decided that we're going to do whatever we can to prevent needless violence and abuse to others, um, like the, the violence and abuse that we were exposed to ourselves. 
So I know a lot of folks who are animal advocates who, whether they even make that direct connection or not, their early exposure to trauma, violence, and abuse led them to make the decision that they're going to speak out for, for non-human animals who may be the kind of the most defenseless among us. So many of us are coming into animal advocacy with trauma experiences of our own. We're also, as I alluded to, we're also exposed to violence experienced by non-human animals. So this, this is a given. Um, and anywhere you look, when, when you're vegan, when you've made that connection to the harm we're doing to animals, everywhere you look, you're seeing violence and pain and, and death, right? You can't go to a grocery store without seeing dead bodies. Um, you can't turn on the TV. You can't watch, uh, watch commercials without there being something about you know, eating animals, etc. Everywhere you look, in all the children's books, there's, there are common themes about animal exploitation that are being taught to, taught to our kids. So the more that we make that connection, the more we're exposed to trauma. And I have spoken with many animal advocates who describe to me uh, what, what is nothing less than a PTSD reaction from all the trauma, all the violence, and all the abuse that they're exposed to, um, to directed towards non-human animals. Also, many of us advocates also experience other forms of oppression, other forms of violence, such as racism, sexism, all the other isms, all the other forms of oppression. You add this on top of the trauma that we're all bringing into our advocacy in the first place and the trauma that the, the animals are going through. Many of us experience psychological abuse from loved ones. And psychological abuse can take many forms. Uh, and it's usually more subtle than physical abuse. Uh, but, for example, being socially alienated from family members, not being, not being invited to, to events, uh, name calling, denigrating comments, trying to lower your sense of self-worth or self-esteem. Um, there's all kinds of psychological abuse that we experience as animal advocates, perhaps from non-vegans uh, who, who I, I know for myself, I regularly get sent pictures of hunting, hunting uh, photos. I regularly get, you know, uh, meat photos sent to me, that sort of stuff, which is really abusive, and it, and it's, and it can really weigh, weigh on you, uh, and, it, and it really adds up. Also, psychological abuse from other advocates, and this is something that is unfortunately all too common in the animal advocacy world, where you get a lot of bullying online, you get advocates trying to undercut other advocates, you get advocates trying to kind of turn people against other people, a lot of um, a lot of shaming, a lot, a lot of really harmful behaviors goes on in animal advocacy. So you add all these things up, and we may not be exposed to all of this, but probably every animal advocate is exposed to at least some of this. And, and we're, we're exposed to a lot of trauma. So let's talk a little bit about what some of the manifestations of trauma are. And first I'm going to talk about the, the problematic manifestations, some of the difficulties that we may experience as a result of our trauma experiences. So I'm going to talk about difficulties trusting others, um, low self-esteem, power and control issues. These first three are more kind of core themes or schemas that can be impacted by trauma. Then there's PTSD, problems with anger and aggression, problems with misanthropy, which is connected to problems with anger and aggression, and, the, and depression. So I'm going to touch on each of these as common manifestations of trauma. And, and I'm not only going to you know, be here talking about all the, you know, woe is us, animal advocates, you know, these are all of our problems. I'm also going to talk after that about what do we do about this, and you know, what can we do to manage our trauma better, to take care of ourselves better, to communicate effectively. And in the end, I'm going to actually talk a little bit about how we can actually grow from our trauma experiences as well. So it's going to get a little more positive, but bear with me through, through the negative. Okay, difficulty trusting others. Now, in my day job, I do group therapy with folks who have trauma and PTSD. And every single group I do, I'll ask them, how many of you have difficulty trusting other people? And every single time I've asked that question, everybody in the room will raise their hand. When you experience trauma, especially if it's at the hand of, hands of somebody you may, may have known or can trust, and it's very common that it leads to difficulties trusting other, trusting other people. Oftentimes when people are exposed to a lot of trauma, they, they don't only feel like they can't trust that specific person who's responsible for the trauma, but it often gets generalized to others. And oftentimes folks who experience trauma will describe not feeling like they can trust anyone. They may feel others will hurt or betray them. This mistrust can even carry over into intimate relationships. 
sometimes controlling behaviors may result because if we don't trust those closest to us, we're, we may be more likely to engage in more controlling behaviors to kind of keep them close and to make sure they're not kind of doing anything that, that will harm us. Self-esteem. This is a really common manifestation of trauma. When we're exposed to a lot of trauma, it's, it's, it's natural for us to feel more down on ourselves. Sometimes folks exposed to trauma unfairly blame themselves for, for, for their trauma. Sometimes we internalize abusive messages when we're experiencing trauma. When others call us worthless, whatever names they're calling us, sometimes what, unfortunately what happens is we start to kind of say those same things to ourselves. Um, and that can lead to low self-esteem as well. We know that when folks suffer from low self-esteem, they tend to be insecure in their relationships um, because you know, you'll, you'll start to feel like, why, is this person, why does this person want anything to do with me? I'm such a loser, I'm such a failure. Why is this person with me at all? Why do they want anything to do with me? And again, that's when more abusive kind of behavior can, can result as well, more controlling kind of behavior because you think the person's gonna abandon you or, or leave you or, or if you're, you're in a relationship, cheat on you or, or what have you. Power and control conflicts. Now this is really important in my field for understanding intimate partner violence. It's also really important when we're thinking about trauma reactions. Oftentimes when folks experience trauma, they feel completely powerless about the trauma they're experiencing, completely helpless, and because they feel like there's really nothing they can do about that situation. And unfortunately, sometimes when, when folks feel really powerless about the trauma they're experiencing, they, they try to exhibit more control over everything else in their world. And that's when the more controlling kind of behaviors can creep in. That's when you can have power struggles with your relationships, including your intimate relationships, which also contributes to abusive behavior. So now I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, PTSD. Um, so first I wanted to talk about just some common themes that are impacted by trauma, you know, self-esteem, trust, power and control. Because for most people when they experience trauma, they don't necessarily develop PTSD. They don't necessarily develop a psychiatric diagnosis. But trauma will affect, can affect folks in a variety of ways, even if you don't develop PTSD. Right? It affects the way that you view the world. Um, so it's important to think about that. But it's also important to consider the role of PTSD, because PTSD can be a pretty devastating uh, problem to have as well. So I'm not going to go through all the symptoms of PTSD, but just in a nutshell, there are three main symptom groupings of PTSD. The first is re-experiencing, and that involves reliving the incident. Uh, so through nightmares, through having memory, traumatic memories recur again and again when you don't want to be having them. It's constantly reliving the trauma in various ways. You can't get it out of your head. You're constantly going over it in your mind. Or when, even when you try to push it back and you try to avoid it, it still comes out in your dreams or it comes out in other places. At, a, at the more extreme level, it comes out as flashbacks. Then there's avoidance and numbing symptoms. And these are symptoms such as uh, avoiding discussing trauma, avoiding anything that, that reminds you of the trauma. Numbing symptoms involve having difficulties expressing or identifying your feelings. Just really, ha really having, expressing no feelings at all, just feeling completely disconnected and numbed out. You don't have any connection to other, other people. This can be really devastating with respect to your close relationships. Um, oftentimes what I see for folks who have PTSD is their family members feel really devastated because they feel like they're with somebody who they no, no longer really recognize. Somebody who's no longer engaged with the family, somebody who's no longer expressing feelings or involved um, with, in, in the relationship at all. Then you have the hyperarousal symptoms. And these are symptoms that reflect an overactive fight or flight response. So basically, you know, having the heightened sense of vigilance, it's called hypervigilance, when you're constantly feeling on edge or you're constantly feeling like somebody might be likely to do harm to you. Um, having an increased startle response, you know, the, the, the stereotypical response that when you hear a loud sound, somebody with PTSD like hits the deck when they have a strong response. Um, th those are examples of, of hyper, hyper arousal symptoms. And these hyper arousal symptoms play a really important role with respect to our interpretation of threat. The survival mode model, I think, is a really helpful model for us to understand how trauma can impact how we're interpreting social situations, how we're responding to other people. 
This is a model that's been used mainly with military veterans. And the idea behind it is that when you're a service member and you're in a war zone and, and you don't know who to trust, it may be adapted for that person in order for them to stay alive, to be constantly vigilant to any potential threat in their environment. So they're constantly scanning their environment. They're constantly trying to determine whether somebody represents a threat to them. So they'll really zero in on somebody's facial expression to try to determine, is this person gonna do harm to me? And usually when they're making an, an assumption, they're assuming the worst rather than the best. Because that's what you do in a war zone to stay alive. You assume that other people are there to do harm to you, and you respond swiftly and with aggression and with anger. Um, because that's what they're trained to do, and that's, that's what keeps them alive. Um, the model for military veterans states that this is something that's very difficult to turn off when the veteran returns home. And they still have this heightened sense of vigilance. They still think that others are out to get them. They can't just turn that switch off. And it, it happens in their relationships, where they assume their partner's trying to push their buttons, or that they assume their partner is cheating on them. They assume their partner is out to get them. They assume their, their partner or other people just aren't on their side. So this is something that's often described in military veterans, but the same exact thing happens in civilians as well, right? For, for those of us who can relate to the you know, idea of being exposed to trauma and impacting our relationships, when you experience trauma, you're gonna be a lot more likely to assume the worst in other people rather than assume the best, right? So you may have what's called a hostile attribution bias, where you don't assume the best in other people, you, you have a hostile attribution uh, tendency. You're more likely to assume they have negative intent in terms of your interactions with them. So you're assuming negative intent, you're assuming the worst in others. Um, and of course, when we're assuming the worst in others, we're gonna misinterpret situations left and right. And I see this happening in animal advocacy all the time. This happens to me all the time with other animal advocates, where they assume that I'm trying to do something to harm them. And I know that they're making that assumption because of their past trauma experiences. Of course, I can't say that. I can't say, look, that's just, you just have PTSD. That's just your PTSD talking about it. I can't diagnose my friends or other animal advocates. But, but I do know that that's where it's coming from. When we experience those negative experiences, when others betray our trust, when others traumatize us in different ways, it carries over into other relationships and we assume the worst. And, and we often misinterpret situations completely. You know, so if you ever say something to somebody and they interpret it in this really like far out way where, where they're kind of assuming you're, you're attacking them in some way or you're trying to do something negative, just keep in mind this might be you know, the result of trauma or some kind of psychological pain that resulted from something that happened in the past to this person. So when we assume the worst in other people, we're gonna have a lot of problems with anger, right? Now I run anger management groups, I, I run groups with domestic violence perpetrators, and this is probably the biggest thing that we work on with them, is trying to not assume the worst in other people. Um, because when, you're, when your thoughts are spinning in a negative direction, that's gonna just fuel your anger. That's gonna fuel your aggression towards other people. So it's really important to be aware of these negative thoughts and, and catch them and correct them. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. So related to this whole idea of trauma and anger and survival mode is misanthropy, right? So misanthropy is, is essentially a hatred of humans or a dislike of humans. Um, so this is a quote, this is from um, my book Millennial Vegan, a quote that I use, it says, I don't care if what I say offends humans because the animal holocaust is the worst atrocity this planet has ever seen. Screw humans and their feelings, I only care about the animals. How many of you have ever said something like this? Raise your hand if you've ever said anything like that. How many of you have heard other people say something like this? <laughs> so, okay, we all know. so what's what's wrong with this? What's wrong with having that misanthropic point of view? Never ending with hatred. Excuse me. Hatred never ending with hatred. Right, hatred never ending with hatred. Right. So um, escalating it or acting or, or showing hate towards other people is not going to bring anything positive. Why else? Why else is this problem? It hinders advocacy. It hinders what? Advocacy. It hinders our advocacy in various ways. Alienating. Alienating. Right. So when we're misanthropic. Um, it's going to be hard for us to reach non-vegans, right? Um, like, like you get a non-vegan who you know eats cheese, and you'd be like, "Well, you're like 
killing baby cows and you're raping your, raping their moms, like you might as well just go and kill yourself, right? Like how, how is that going to get that person any closer to going vegan, right? Um, so it's, it's, it can be harmful to our advocacy in various ways because if we want to be effective advocates, we have to find something to, to connect with that other person to help bring them along in terms of changing their behavior. It also doesn't bring movements together. It doesn't bring in other social justice movements. When we say, I don't care about your problem, I don't care about your oppression, I don't care about the injustice you experience, I only care about non-human animals. Basically, we're telling like large, large groups of people, I don't care about you, I don't want to join with you, and, and I'm also, also by the way, I'm a hypocrite because I claim to care about social justice, but I only care about this one little component of social justice. Well, it's not little. I only care about the one aspect of social justice in my life. Yes? Also sound contradictory because the person speaking is you, the rest is true. <laughs> right, so he's saying it sounds contradictory because the other person is human. The, 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 the other person speaking is human. The person speaking is human themselves, right? So they're saying. Humans and the feelings are right, and that's probably what they'll say. The point say, yeah, I do hate myself as well. I mean, that, that is often the kind of sentiment we hear in the more misinterpreted kind of deacons. Um, it's also not good for us, right? When, when we're carrying around all that anger, when we're um, carrying around these, these kinds of thoughts, it's going to lead to a lot of other problems. And I'll talk about that. Actually, I'll talk about that now. Um, it, it, it can contribute to depression. And, and I think having that having that misanthropic point of view, it really to me is kind of a de de depressogenic way of thinking, right? So um, you definitely have negative views of the world, right? People are terrible. Um, negative views of self. So when we're exposed to trauma, we often like I talked about, we often have self-esteem problems, so thoughts such as I'm worthless. And negative views of the future, often when we're exposed to a lot of trauma, when we feel like things will never change. So a lot of animal advocates I know say these very things. They really you know, have low self-esteem, they have negative views of the world, negative views of, of, uh, of the future. And that's really a recipe for, for major depression, right? And these are the, this is called the cognitive triad. For those of you who are familiar with Aaron Beck, who is kind of the like, leader in understanding depression and treating depression, th this is the cognitive triad. Th these three forms of thinking um, really contribute heavily to depression. And how to treat depression really involves focusing on these ways of thinking. So, and and I, I believe that misan misanthropy and anger fuel all of this stuff. Okay. Well, thanks for hanging in there We're talking about all the really <laughs> depressing stuff. Talking about depressing, like that was like, as long as that 15 or 20 minutes of like pure depressing you know, <laughs> commentary. Yeah. All right, so let's shift gears a little bit and talk about how do we cope with all this? How do we cope with trauma-related problems? And you know, I, I'm not here to say that the, that I have all the answers and that we should do everything that I say. And it's for that it's easy at all. But these are just some strategies that I think target many of the problems that I just talked. about. First, we need to speak out and, and reach out to others. We need to make sure that we are not afraid to express our feelings. Um, obviously, it's a recipe for depression, for anger, for PTSD, when we hold in our feelings, when we avoid talking about what's going on with us. That's a main contributor to all of the problems that I just described, all the psychiatric problems that, that are related to trauma. We have to, we have to talk about our feelings to others in, in any way that we possibly can. We also need to label violence and abuse. We need to be aware of violence and abuse when it's happening. So for example, psychological abuse. When somebody's being abusive to you, it's really helpful for you to recognize, you know, this is abusive, this is not okay, and, and I'm not gonna let you do this, right? So we have to know what, what abuse looks like and recognize violence and abuse so we can do something about it and, and minimize our exposure to that. We need to seek out others to talk to. Uh, as animal advocates, I think it's really critical that we talk to other animal advocates about what, what we're exposed to, what we're doing, what our struggles are. I know I have one or two other advocates I try to talk to once a week if I can, and that's really important. You know, just like we as clinical psychologists know the importance of talking to our co-therapists about, about our groups. It's the same thing because we don't want to develop vicarious traumatization, we don't want to develop problems just from hearing story after story of violence and abuse. Same thing in animal advocacy, when we are exposed to all the different forms of trauma that I talked about at the very beginning, it's really important to seek out other like-minded folks and talk about this stuff with them. Let me just, uh, let me just spontaneously ask you all as a group, 
how many of you make a point of this, of reaching out to other animal advocates and talking about things that you're dealing with? Okay, so a lot of you do. How many of you feel like you could probably do more of that? Okay, so, so most of you feel that way. I, I, think this, I do think this is really important. Seek qualified professional help if, if you need to. And I'm not saying if you all need to go and see psychologists, you know, that's all up to you, you know, what, what you need help with. What I will say, though, is that if you feel like you're suffering from trauma and PTSD, then, then you should seek help. And if anybody tries to minimize what you're saying and tries to tell you, oh, that's ridiculous, you know, you're experiencing PTSD because of animal advocacy or because of violence to non-human animals, if a therapist suggests anything like that, go find a new therapist, right? I, I hear a lot of really bad, you know, really terrible stories from folks who seek psychologists or seek therapists, and the therapist is, is really um, invalidating of their experiences. So find somebody who will really listen to you and validate the trauma, the negative experiences that, that you're describing to them. If they, if they start to talk to you like, you're, you know, you being vegan, you know, it's like having an eating disorder or, you're, or anything like that, just like leave that therapist and you can find somebody else, right? Because a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of therapists, a lot of clinicians don't understand animal advocacy, they don't understand veganism, just like the general population doesn't. So find somebody that really understands and really will listen to you. And I talked about know that your experiences are, are valid and refuse to be silenced by others. There's a whole lot of people that would love all of us just to shut the heck up, right? <laughs> um, probably many of our loved ones, a whole lot of people online, I, I've run across many of them, would love us to be quiet about, you know, to stop, to stop speaking about, out about the trauma that non-human animals are experiencing. And some would like us to stop talking about our, our own trauma reactions as well. We, and we have to really be careful not to silence ourselves. Set limits and boundaries. This is really important for whatever you're, whatever you're doing. And this is something, and this is a really important part of being assertive. So finding that middle path between being overly passive and keeping everything in and being overly aggressive with other people is being assertive. And part of being assertive is to let other people know what your limits are, what your boundaries are. So if you feel like somebody's being abusive to you, if somebody's exposing you to trauma that you don't need to be exposed to, let them know or get away from that person or unfriend them on Facebook or whatever it is that you need to do to minimize your, your exposure to trauma and negativity if you feel like it's not good for you. And oftentimes people ask me questions like, you know, should I go to this event where folks are gonna be eating animals or should I not? Or um, what should I do about my family member who's you know, eats animals and teases me about it, or, or, or what have you. And, you know, there's, there's really no set answer for any of this, because it's all up to you what your limits are, what's good for you, what isn't good for you. So you all need to be sure about and think about where your limits and boundaries are with other people. <clears throat> One thing um, that I find to be really helpful is to use what's called I statements. So I statements is just you saying how you feel. So I feel hurt because you did this, or I feel upset. Or it could involve you telling your own story, your own animal advocacy story. You know, I'm vegan because I just, I, I realized that, I, at some point I realized that I just could not justify contributing to the needless killing of animals anymore. The more that we talk from our own perspective, the, the, more, likely, it's, the more likely others will listen to what you have to say. The, the, uh, the opposite of an I statement is a you statement. So if you say, you need to stop doing this, or you need to do that, or you're murdering animals, or, or whatever it is, you're gonna get a much more defensive, a much more hostile reaction, and a lot more exposure to violence and, and trauma if, if that's the way you're gonna go about your interactions with other people. Don't internalize harmful, mes uh, harmful messages. That may be easier said than done, but really try to do work in that area. Well, again, don't engage in negative self-talk when other people are telling you that you're worthless, or telling you you're stupid, telling you you're this or that. Just, just be mindful that this is their trauma, this is their stuff, and this isn't about you at all. This is about them, and this is their problem. This doesn't say anything about who you are as a person. Don't internalize any of that. This is them, and it's not you. We all help create our own social world, and this is why events like this are so important. I think it's really important to be around like-minded people, people we can talk to, people we can relate to. So do whatever you need to do to feel like you're comfortable in your own circle. 
in your own world as much as much as you possibly can. And of course, you know, self-care. It's kind of cliche to say we need to engage in self-care, but we really do. And um, I'm sure if I ask, you know, a show of hands, how many of you could do better at well let me ask you, how many of you could do better at self-care? Raise your hand. So pretty much everybody. <laughs> I know, I know I can. I could as well. So we, we really do need to be mindful of kind of where we're at in terms of our exposure to violence and trauma. We need to take we need to take good care of ourselves. We need to take breaks from trauma, from violence. We need to do whatever whatever we can to make sure that we're going back into things kind of in in, in a healthy as, as healthy as we possibly can. So I want to talk a little bit about, about our thoughts, uh, because really our thoughts are what kind of fuel just about everything. Our thoughts are what often fuel our problems with anger, our depression, our PTSD. All of these things are fueled by our thoughts. Again, I think it's really important to avoid that misanthropic worldview for reasons that I talked about. As you can tell, I really I really have a problem with misanthropy. I think, I think it's a big issue because I feel like there are many animal advocates out there who have this more misanthropic kind of stance. And, I, and, I, and I'm concerned because a lot of young animal advocates kind of have that misanthropic point of view. And I, and I do think it's harmful not only, not only for their advocacy, but for themselves as well. Try to recognize your negative thought patterns and replace them with more positive thoughts. Again, that's something that I know it sounds easier to say than done. Oh yeah, sure, I'll just recognize my negative thoughts and think positively. I don't expect you all to be going around kind of thinking the world is sunshine and rainbows, right? Because obviously there's a lot of horrible things out there, all the trauma and violence that we're exposed to on a daily basis that I talked about at the beginning. But as much as you can, try to catch yourself when you're kind of negatively interpreting other people. When, you're, when your thoughts are starting to race in a negative direction. When you're assuming the worst in other people, try to catch yourself doing that and try to not either not assume anything in other people or, or assume the best if you have to assume something. Give others the benefit of a doubt and don't assume others' intentions. And lastly, you know, we can feel pride and satisfaction from, from doing good. So we should be telling ourselves that, you know, that we're doing the best that we can, that we're trying to you know, make a change in the world, and let ourselves feel good about our advocacy and what we're doing to try to prevent and try to reduce violence and trauma that are out there. You know, one really good way to prevent depression is to help others. And that's something that I really found out early on in my career as a psychologist, actually as a grad student. The more that I devoted my energies to try to improve the, the human condition, the more I focus on other people rather than myself, the less depressed I, I would feel. And I, I am sure I would be severely depressed if I didn't do any work in violence prevention, if I didn't do animal advocacy. So I think it's, it's really important for us to feel good about the advocacy that we're doing and to try to do as much of it as, as we can. Just some other tips for coping with anger and depression. Remember that anger is the easiest emotion to express. It's not hard to just say, you know, I hate, I hate you, I hate everybody. It's not hard to be misanthropic, right? Uh, just to say, I don't, I don't care about you. That, that's probably the easiest thing you can do. But there's almost always other feelings that are underneath the anger. There's almost always feelings of hurt, of sadness, of shame, of frustration. And those are really the feelings that are most important to get out to express to that other person. Those underlying feelings are really at the heart of a lot of the difficulties we experience from all the trauma that, that, that we're exposed to. So we want to develop an awareness of those underlying feelings as much as we can, try to recognize what it is we're feeling uh, in addition to the anger. In the work that I do, a lot of folks I work with will describe having difficulty expressing feelings because they feel like it's a sign of weakness somehow, that they're making themselves vulnerable, um, and that, that they're being weak because they're kind of just expressing vulnerable feelings. But really, what I, what I tell them, what I'll tell you all, is that it's really just the opposite of that. It really takes a lot of strength to, to express those softer emotions to other people, to let, to let other people know that you're really having a tough time or you're feeling sad or you're feeling hurt. To really put yourself out there and make yourself vulnerable takes courage. Um, to, it, it takes courage, so um, I encourage you to kind of avoid any kinds of thoughts that, you know, I'm any less of a person or any less, like a lot of men feel this way. I'm less of a man if I express my feelings. 
Okay, so lastly, I want to try to end on, on a bit of a positive note. Uh, post-traumatic growth. How many of you have heard of, of post-traumatic growth before? Raise your hand. Okay, so a handful of you. You're probably clinicians or, or, uh, or in the helping field in some way. Uh, so the idea of post-traumatic growth, these are the conditions. Someone experiences trauma that seriously challenges their core beliefs, their beliefs about the world. They endure major psychological struggle, struggle that may include PTSD or mental illness, and the person ultimately finds a sense of personal growth. So I, I wanted to end with this because I don't want to I don't want to describe trauma as necessarily debilitating and necessarily leading to PTSD and all the problems. It may lead to those problems, but you may also grow from the experience. I know a lot of you know really amazing activists that I know have experienced trauma and it's and it's fueled their passion and it's really um, I think kind of it's really broadened their sense of compassion, their sense of uh, mission and purpose, and their their focus. So I don't want to say you know trauma is always going to just only lead to negative things. There's also a growth aspect of it. That if we're able to work through it, if we're able to overcome it, if we're able to talk about it with other people, um, the trauma will never the trauma will never go away. But you may get to a point someday where you can look back and really feel proud about you know, how, how far you've, how much you've grown from it, how far you've come from, from when you first experienced the trauma. And that's, that's it, thank you. Okay, any, any questions, comments? Yes, did you have your Yes. Hi, I'm, um, I've been uh, vegetarian for nine years and I've just recently become uh, vegan. And um, just the last four months, I've always wanted to become vegan, and I'm very, very happy I finally made this step. Um, I, due to work, I, I go a lot on retreats, meditation retreats, also other kind of retreats with uh, people that are very spiritual. <laughs> However, <laughs> there's still a lot of them um, that are not vegetarian or vegan, and it's becoming more and more difficult for me. I used to be able to be very compassionate about it. Also coming from the Tibetan Buddhist point of view, and, but um, nowadays I just have so much anger, and it's so difficult. Uh, and I just I know that's not I, I can't influence anyone in this way. And I did I used to very well just through my passion of um, enjoying being vegetarian and veganism. And, but so any tips? Yes. <laughs> well, I, I don't I don't have a great solution to that. Uh, my mother is a Buddhist, and she's not vegan. Um, so I, I, I feel that very personally. Um, I don't know if Will's in the room, but Will's talking next, and this is something he talks about a lot. Will Tuttle talks a lot about veganism and kind of bringing it into Buddhism. Um, this is, um, it's a challenge, you know, and, and I, I've written a couple books where I talk about how we can communicate with others about this. For me, one, help, one helpful thing that, that I do, and I think Will might talk about this as well, is I view others as pre-vegans. Right? Instead of carnists, <laughs> not even non vegans right? I believe that everybody, everybody I'm close with, I have confidence that they will ultimately go vegan. And I'm mindful that I was once in a, in a similar place to, to them, right? So as frustrating, frustrating as it is, when we go vegan, we're like, oh my, you're like, I can't believe, like, you finally make that connection, you want everybody to make that, and you feel like you should just be able to talk to them, and then, like, they're going to go vegan, right? But that's, not, that's usually not the way it happened for us. Usually it was a process, and it will probably be the same for these other folks as well. It's frustrating, I know it's, I know it's frustrating, but that's one of the things that helps me. I tell myself, it's a process, they're pre-vegan, they're gonna get there. And it actually has been starting to happen with some of my family members, but it's taken several years for them to, to make that connection. Even if it's somebody who's coming from a background of spirituality and saying that <laughs> their, their mission in life is to be compassionate. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's amazing how um, people can can kind of cut themselves off to like what should be like clear truths, right? It should be obvious, right? If we want to minimize the harm we do to others, we probably shouldn't be contributing to the needless killing of non-human animals, right? I mean, the, the, it's amazing what the human mind can do. Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> Other questions, comments?
Yeah, I was just curious, uh, in the meeting community, I've uh, come across a lot of people that watch traffic footage to kind of inspire themselves and motivate themselves. And I'm just wondering if you think that could have long-term effects or if you think that might work for some people. Um, and I guess what your recommendations would be. So I, I get asked that question a fair amount. Um, and again, that's one of those things that's different for everybody. Um, but I, I think the important thing is that you maintain awareness of how it's impacting you. So some people can view that stuff and they're, they feel inspired from it, right? But others don't feel that way. And it's almost like they force themselves to watch it. They feel like they, you know, as a vegan, as an animal advocate, everybody should watch Earthlings, right? Everybody should watch it. But you don't have to. You know, if you're vegan, you don't have to do that. And, and um, most people, most vegans I know, most animal advocates don't, don't do that. I mean, why put yourself through that? I don't need to see, I don't need to see footage of what happens to an animal to know what happens. I've seen it before. All I really need to see is, I need to see it once, I guess, and then never again. Yes. Thank you for being so close. <laughs> yeah. I know how you said change your therapist if any of children don't understand you. I guess we have none in Turkey. I'm a positive psychologist and I have these uh, like YouTube channels and other kinds of social media that has a lot of following about animal rights and stuff. And people know that I'm a psychologist, but I'm a positive psychologist, I'm not a clinical psychologist, and I don't see patients. But I get all these messages from so many people going to therapy and they complain about their therapist and they ask me who to go who to go to and I have I know no one who would understand them. So <laughs> yeah, that, that's that, that's really tricky. Um, so yeah, I, I didn't necessarily notice they didn't say go to a vegan therapist, right? Yeah, but I, I think I think it's almost like finding a relationship partner, right? That some people will date or marry a non-vegan partner, but the important thing is that their partner is open to listening, and and, the, and they're not um, they're not invalidating, right? So I think a therapist will listen to your experience and not shut you down and really take it as valid. I think is kind of the bare minimum that, that we should be able to expect from like a provider. I see what happens is once somebody goes to a therapist, I've even had messages where people talked about their therapist making fun of them for their veganism. So they actually get traumatized during therapy and then never trust anyone else in the therapist. Yeah, that's, that, that's obviously... Yeah, that's, yeah, exactly. That's very, that's very bad therapy behavior. We should get out of it and stop seeing that therapist. But I know I know Will's here. Will's up next, so we should probably end there. Uh, if anybody wants to talk to me over the next couple of days, I'm at the Vegan Publishers table just around the corner, and I have a couple of books um, that I can sign as well. So thank you all for your time.